Funding for this program was provided by the National Institute of Justice. Hello, I'm James Wilson. In the 1970s, researchers concluded that programs to rehabilitate criminal offenders didn't work. At the same time, it was becoming clear that chronic offenders were responsible for a disproportionate amount of crime. And these chronic offenders usually started their careers when they were juveniles. Without much hope of changing behavior, the purpose of punishment became putting criminals behind bars. Despite this gloomy outlook, some people interested in helping juvenile offenders didn't give up on the goal of rehabilitation. They developed and tested new programs, and evaluators found that some of these programs had promising results. Most juvenile offenders who commit serious crimes find themselves locked up in traditional settings, but the new rehabilitation programs offer some juveniles a distinct alternative. One of these programs is the Paint Creek Youth Center. It looks like a summer camp, but it's an innovative residential treatment center for the most serious juvenile offenders, 15 to 18-year-olds whose crimes range from burglary to rape and murder. Located in rural Ohio, Paint Creek accommodates about 30 juveniles who stay for about a year, or longer in the case of sex offenders. Paint Creek provides a highly structured treatment program based on intensive, positive peer pressure. When I first came here, I didn't like it. I thought they were trying to brainwash me. But now, I mean, once I've taken a look at you know, the people I've victimized and how my life was so screwed up, and I've seen that I can make, you know, make it change. When you first get here, you really don't have no care and attitude for nothing. If you take time and work with the program, let the program work with you, you'll see in the long run that you're glad you didn't and you had to stay there and deal with your problems. Dealing with your problems begins the day the youths arrive. They learn by observing, um, by watching the higher team members uh, confront each other, um, support each other. It's uh, modeling the appropriate behaviors. Um, they learn it through, when they don't do these type of things, they confront each other. And that's telling them that this is wrong, you're not supposed to be doing that. Somebody that's you know, already had good victim awareness knows who their victims are and how they felt, maybe has a better, better uh, understanding and can point it out better to somebody who doesn't. So it's helped me out a lot. When all the peers are together, they focus more right on the point and make you become more humiliated with yourself, who you victimized, and make you really want to start changing and take a look at yourself, because that's the first step. You got to own your behaviors and realize that you got to change. Society won't accept you as a criminal. Wanting to change doesn't come automatically at Paint Creek. It's built into the therapeutic program that Dr. Vicki Agee designed and directs. We feel like we have to create the motivation for treatment rather than wait till it just appears. So we do that uh, by increasing empathy for their victims, which we hope will create enough remorse so that they have the motivation to change behavior. Without warning, Dr. Ag set up a role-playing situation with three peers whose faces we were permitted to photograph. What are you using for a car? The box. Okay. Well, I know you have to get pretty creative with your role plays. We're going to have first aid kit, uh, the band-aids. We're going to have two paramedics, two police officers, and reenact the park scene to where he ran over the 14-year-old boy. The teenager doesn't have any idea 
what's about to hit him. I don't want to kill him, man. Hey, that's him. There he is. Oh, he's dead, man. Get out, get out, get out, get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. Oh, man, you hit the wrong person. Let's go, man. Let's get out of here, man. Carl came out of nowhere, man. Just playing a game of basketball. Uh, you didn't see what the guys looked like or anything? Oh, it looks like they had oh. a mask on their face, something. They had masks. Yeah, I'm gonna Okay, go, let's go. What we need to do now is sit down and talk about the feelings that you would have from his family. Your own family. How do you think they would feel? And how do you feel seeing your friend get hit while you're playing in the park? And since you were a victim today, what were some things that went through your mind? What type of feelings, thoughts were you having? And what do you think you're having laying in bed in the hospital in critical condition for three weeks? I'm scared. Thinking I might die. Revenge. You know, from his, from the, from the victimizer's point of view, doesn't really want, you know, didn't really matter. I was scared. I was worried about me getting caught. I wasn't worried about how he, how the victim felt. I was worried about. Juveniles are now, also required to face their families and recite all their crimes, even ones for which they were never caught. How did you feel as the... They were kind of shocked and kind of confused and hurt it's like a lot of different emotions you know towards me at once but they didn't like this desert me or anything like that they kept you know helping me out with it for me it's when I done my family intake told my family about my crimes my father it's the first time I ever seen him cry and some of them they expected of it but the other things that they didn't know they were real shocked and upset about it it makes me feel I'm, like it's hard for me to describe. It's like the lowest scum because I know that um, children could have died from the drugs that I have sold, and families could be, you know, without their children, and there isn't really a way I can repay that. When the juveniles finally feel remorse, the work of rebuilding appropriate social skills can begin. Vocational training teaches the boys how to succeed at work. As in all programs, counselors stress anger management and accountability for behavior. These teenagers are learning how to ask a boss for a ride downtown. What if, instead of, if you know he doesn't want to talk to you, and it's a situation where it's something that you have to talk to him about. Intimidating. That's a, that's a, it's a criminal thinking. That's no, a it's, phone. that is. It's definitely criminal thinking. Not like. Is there any way that you can open him up? Paint Creek also provides incentives for change through a system of rewards and punishments based on daily evaluations. They're scored on their thinking errors for that day in the seven categories we have, which are power thrust, inability to empathize, victim stance, false pride, impulsive, failure to accept obligations, and being straight. So if they use any thinking errors under those areas, they can lose points. If they did an excellent job in that area, they can earn points for it. The teenagers must earn a certain number of points to be promoted. Paint Creek has been operating for only four years. A preliminary study says that only 15% of Paint Creek graduates have gone back to jail. That's compared to 50% of those released from the regular juvenile correctional facility. When we leave here, there isn't really any reason why we shouldn't be able to handle the responsibilities of being out there because we have to be able to handle them here and we have plenty of them to handle. After release, it's going to be our toughest job is staying on top and remembering what you learned here and making responsible decisions so you don't repeat your crime or do something else to hurt other people and end up back in jail. With me to discuss these matters are Peter Greenwood of the RAND Corporation's Criminal Justice Program, Frank Alarcon, Chief Deputy Director, California Youth Authority, and Vicki Agee, Director of the Paint Creek Youth Center in Ohio. Vicki, in a sentence or two, what do you think is the key to the program's apparent success at Paint Creek? 
I think the key has to do with the fact that it's appropriate treatment uh, in that it's target to their, targeted to their needs, to their capabilities, and uh, is targeted to higher risk cases. And also it uses a very, very comprehensive cognitive behavioral approach. With what them. does cognitive behavioral approach mean? In a sense, it's a program which addresses their thinking patterns because thinking controls behaviors. And what we want, of course you can't change anybody who doesn't want to change, who doesn't see that it's in their best interest to change. And so what we're trying to do is address uh, certain cognitive deficits such as uh, low empathy for other people. As, as you could see in the little role play on victim awareness, uh, we spend a great deal of time trying to get them to understand what other people feel. How many boys who come to Paint Creek can't handle this, don't have the capacity or the willingness to change and thus drop out? How many people do you lose along the way? Uh, I would say that roughly over the four years, uh, Peter could correct me on this, but I'd say roughly maybe 12 to 15 percent. We, we're trying to get it lower and lower. The only problem is this is an open setting, so there's some uh, use that just can't handle an open setting. An open setting means that they can leave if they want to. There's no fence, is that right? Right, there's no fence. Uh, and is there, any, is there any restriction on the kinds of boys who are sent there? Are certain kinds of offenders kept out of Paint Creek? Not really. We really have no control over admission. Uh, so they're just uh, felony ones or twos. Uh, we don't have any other control over uh, kinds of offenders. What struck me about watching the tape was that Paint Creek is a small program in a pleasant setting and it has a lot of staff people around to help the boys. Do you think this program could work if it were tried in a facility that had 300 boys or could it be made to work in all parts of Ohio and not just Paint Creek? Sure, it could. Uh, in fact, uh, the last program I ran, run was on the grounds, ran was on the grounds of a large public training school. The only thing is you have to break it down into small, semi-autonomous groups. Uh, so I feel that you can do it in the public sector or in the private sector. Why then isn't it done in the public sector? Why isn't the state of Ohio's juvenile correctional program all run the way Paint Creek is run? Well, lots of reasons. I think just uh, two very general reasons is one, they're very overpopulated, and secondly, they're very under-resourced. Um, and so your program, if it were put in place statewide, would be a program that would take more resources, which means more people to help out? Uh, somewhat. Uh, it really isn't that much more costly than the public system, but more of the money is invested in staff, so we have a richer staffing ratio. Um, also, uh, we have, uh, as you can see, a, a small facility and the large old training schools. It's very difficult to run effective programs in those um, Is there any special advantage to your program in the fact that it's run by a private firm which contracts with the state rather than being run by a state agency? Uh, although I've done both, I would say yes, there's a lot of advantages of doing it in the private sector. For one thing, uh, there's the element of competitiveness, that is, you have to do a good job, turn out a quality product, so to speak, because you're competing with other agencies. Let's ask the same question to Frank Alarcon. As uh, Deputy Director of the California Youth Authority, you're responsible for over 8,000 young people, not 30. Uh, what lessons, if any, do you see in Paint Creek that could be applied or perhaps are being applied now in the California Youth Authority? Well, I think the, the basic lesson we learned from programs like Vicky's, and there are many programs like hers around the country, is there is a place for small community-based programs in the juvenile justice system. But it's not an either-or equation. It's not either community-based, small, or large training schools like we have in the Youth Authority in California. I think they both have a role. I, I kind of make it uh, a comparison. It's not unlike comparing IBM or an Apple to a small entrepreneur who produces software. There is a place for both. There are some things that she can offer in her program, particularly around some specific individual attention, that we can try to emulate by breaking down our, our training school into small living units with, with uh, intensive treatment teams, but we could probably never quite give the same individual attention that well, her program Why not? Does. Is it a shortage of money or the fact that you can't locate these facilities in so many small locations around the state? Well, it, I, can, I can only speak to California uh, in, in directly responding. There is definitely a straitjacket around the resources in California, and there are some real tight restraints 
on what we can and cannot do ever since Proposition 13. But she suggested that her program didn't really require a lot more money. It was just a question of how the money was spent, spent in small units and spent more on staff and on other things. Is there a restriction on well, shifting resources that way? I think what we found in looking at programs around the country we have, uh, similar to Vicki's, is that the costs aren't that much uh, less expensive. and. More important, in California, we have other obstacles that we'd have to overcome to have that many facilities around the state holding, say, 8,200 8, youth throughout California. We, we've had, for over a year, we've been trying to cite, for example, an in lieu of revocation program for parolees who... What's who, an in lieu revocation program? Th this would be a program for parolees who get in trouble when they're on parole because of drug or alcohol abuse. Instead of revoking their parole, returning them to the institution, having a small community-based program uh, housed in a, in a local community, preferably urban, because that's where most of our kids come from, uh, so they can stay in one of those programs for, say, 90 days, rather than coming back to the Youth Authority for 6 to 12 and months. And your problem is to time. find a place to put it. Exactly. We have spent over a year trying to site such a facility. And the reaction is not in my backyard? You've got it. I see. Is there any reason why the state of California can't contract with private suppliers of these treatment programs of the sort that Vicki represents, or do you now contract with private we suppliers? Ha we have examples of contracting services. An uh, example is we have a uh, mother-infant care program for the young woman who uh, is either with child or uh, uh, has a small children. Uh, we place them in a program located in Alameda County. Uh, where they provide some very specialized services for that kind of, of young person. Uh, but to do it in a large way would be very, very difficult. Why is it difficult? Uh, would trade unions object or, or other people object? One of the problems I alluded to already, and that's citing. Another mm -hmm. problem, certainly we have uh, very strong uh, unions in California, and they play a significant role, and they're highly professional. And I think third is, is the question of public safety. Mm -hmm. uh, Californians are very, very concerned about crime. And I think if the type of youth that we're talking about in the Youth Authority, uh, if they were in open programs, would probably create quite a fear. See, there's a real danger here because mm -hmm. we, we often have comparisons between states and between mm -hmm. programs. I'm always skeptical of that because it's often an apple-orange mm -hmm. comparison. And of course, in your program, the Youth Authority, you take on the whole older offenders with a more serious criminal record. That's correct. Well, let me talk to Peter Greenwood from Rand. Peter, you have been studying criminal rehabilitation or its failure for years. And uh, I noted at the outset that for a long time in the 1970s, um, the evidence seemed to suggest that things weren't working. And now we hear from Vicki Agee that at least at Paint Creek and maybe elsewhere, things are working. What's changed? I think there's, there's been developed some new powerful statistical techniques, meta-analysis for one, which is a way that lets people mine the old data in a more uh, powerful way. One of the things that people discovered is many of the old uh, evaluations, the experimental programs on their face never set out, never accomplished what they set out to do. So they never really tested the methods. And when people go back and can control on that and look in more detail at, at how much training went into the program and do they really deliver the services they were supposed to, they are showing that a lot of the experimental programs had not dramatic but modest uh, uh, positive effects on the order of uh, 20 to 30 percent in reducing recidivism rate. The techniques that seem to work best are the social learning, uh, cognitive behavioral techniques that get, that get offenders or get juveniles to think about their, uh, or to be aware of their thinking patterns that uh, provide them an opportunity to practice, to role play, to rehearse mm -hmm. the kinds of uh, techniques that they have to use. Programs seem to work better in the community than they do in institutions. Uh, positive peer culture improves the effectiveness of any particular program. Okay, now let me ask you this question. You've been evaluating Paint Creek and your final results aren't in. Uh, do you feel so far that the results that were reported in the film we just saw are correct? That is to say that uh, there is a substantially lower rate of recidivism among the boys leaving Paint Creek than there is among boys leaving other Ohio institutions. There, there appears to be for the first 44 kids who left Paint Creek. I see. Yes. And how do we know this? How do we make these comparisons? How can we be sure that it isn't something else that's making this effect? Well, the general problem you have is you set up what's supposed to be a good experimental program and the judges send all the better kids there. And then if they turn out to be better, you never know if it's selection or, or uh, what have you. In this case, we've got a real random assignment. Uh, in the counties that are, that are eligible to send kids to the Paint Creek Youth Center, the judges or the courts actually call us at Rand when they have an eligible youth 
and we determine on a random assignment basis whether that youth goes to one of the regular training schools or goes into Paint Creek. So we really have an equal population going through the training schools. So we're in effect flipping the coin Creek. when each boy's name comes up. Exactly. Does this create any problem with the boys or the judges or lawyers who think that uh, boys who are going to Paint Creek are getting the easier ride and therefore it's unfair to the boys who aren't going to Paint Creek? I don't think it's seen as easier. Uh, uh, if you saw that program, it's a very tough, uh, comprehensive program. The kids work there very hard. Uh, it turns out that the youth that go to Paint Creek are serving a little bit longer time. The ones who go to the controls get out in about nine months. Paint Creek youth are serving on the order of about a year. So it's not looked at as much uh, easier. And the judges really want to know, and they've come to understand that this is what it's going to take to, to allow them to know whether or not the program is more effective. So, let's, so suppose, they do accept it. let's suppose that this analysis is borne out in the final analysis and that Paint Creek is doing a better job. Will we know then what it is about Paint Creek that makes the difference so we'll know what to try next time? We'll just know the whole package, uh, from the positive peer culture to the cognitive behavioral techniques, the very intensive aftercare program that goes afterwards. And the only way we'll know exactly what it was is to start teasing out those individual pieces and applying them elsewhere. If you were starting elsewhere, Vicki, and wanted to put a program in place, let's say in California or New York or any other state you're familiar with, perhaps elsewhere in Ohio, uh, and you were given a fixed budget, a tight budget, you couldn't spend much money. Would you try to pick and choose from the elements of the Paint Creek program, or would you really feel that you have to have the whole package in place for it to make a difference? Well, actually, I am just about to open uh, another program in Florida in mid-June, and it'll be in a locked setting. And uh, no, I think I would need the whole package, even though I've always worked on a fixed budget. So uh, this is not really a a highly resourced program, but I need all the elements of the program. Does your firm, or the firm you're connected with that runs Pate Creek, does it make a profit on this? No, this is a non-profit. A non-profit organization. It gets all its money, therefore, from the state. Yes, it does in per diems. And so that if you going into this, you can't go into this, this with the idea of, of getting rich, at least at your current budget level. So you have to go yeah. into it because you care about the outcomes. Certainly. And what about the staff? It strikes me that watching this tape um, and talking to you, uh, we have a group of very dedicated and talented and committed people. Uh, many people think that those qualities are in short supply in society, that it's hard to find good, dedicated staff people. Either they don't exist or will suffer from burnout. Did you find it hard to find staff people? I certainly didn't, but uh, one, one of the nice things is that we're located in a rural area where there's a very strong work ethic. Uh, and I think that that's important. But then I've also had programs in uh, urban areas. People, I think that people are drawn to this field who, who have a lot of dedication. There are, however, other problems uh, in the public system because if you have a very entrenched, say, civil service system or uh, union system where you can't uh, get rid of people that aren't appropriate, uh, for working with kids or you don't have any selection over getting the people that really are dedicated, uh, then it's much more problematic getting this kind of, we call it a positive staff culture. Frank Alarcon a moment ago said that one of the problems he would have in doing what you do in California or perhaps in other states is nobody wants this, at least initially, in their backyard. Did the people living near Paint Creek not want it in their backyard? Mm, they certainly didn't. They were terrified. It's just a small village of 600 people, and these are serious offenders in their midst. Um, but I think that they're very proud of the unit. They feel a lot of ownership now after four years. How do you reassure them when you go in and say, these people are not going to burglarize your homes or mug you on the street? What arguments can you make that would deal with their fears? The, the argument that we make is that their safety is our first priority. And I think all effective programs put community protection first. So, of course, those were just words. They had to know that. And what they found out is that anybody that tries to escape from Paint Creek is immediately captured by us. Uh, there's only been two in four years who've actually escaped from the area, and my community services workers caught them. And what happened to the ones that escaped? They, what, did, what happened to the ones that escaped? Yes. They were sent to other institutions. So they don't get a second chance at Paint Creek, at least Some, not right away. Sometimes we've given them a second chance, but generally we don't. And that's part of our community protection promise to the community, saying 
in effect, if this kid continues to try to get out of this open setting, we're going to see to it that you're as safe as you can possibly be. He'll go to a locked unit. Frank, if you were just starting out afresh in California and you had told create the California Youth Authority on a blank sheet of paper, but be aware that you're going to have to handle 8,000 young people and be aware that money is in short supply. What would you create? A, a lot of little units like Paint Creek or something else? Or, or what is the strategy you would follow? To I think I'd have a full range of services from uh, in-home services all the way to the youth training school, a very secure youth training school. But, but if Paint Creek it works and if Peter Greenwood testimony that it works stands the test yeah. of time, why not have all Paint Creeks? I mean, why have anything else if well, other things haven't been no, shown to work? Good question. Uh, I, I think maybe we haven't mentioned the fact that uh, things can work in youth training schools, too. Let me just give you a, okay. a couple of examples. We did a rather interesting story. Our research division did a, a rather interesting study uh, several years ago looking at success on parole. And this study looked at those parolees, those wards that went through our institutions, out in parole, and then were successful on the street for at least two years no new crimes, no arrests, clean. We found from that study three things were most significant to their success. One was that they had got a job and retained a job. Second is they stayed drug and alcohol free. And third is they had a great relationship with their parole agent. Now those so, are three big ifs. Those are th okay, three big ifs. Mm -hmm. well, what did we do with that information? Yes. Well, what we did is we restructured our entire education system around employability getting kids jobs and keeping the jobs. We brought in private industry, our free venture private industry program, where we bring businesses into our institutions, they run their businesses there, hire our wards at prevailing rates, give them real meaningful jobs, and therefore links to the community to get real jobs. The payoff there so far, we've examined the 1986 cohort, which is the first one to be out in the street long enough to measure, against a comparison group. They, their recidivism rate was 28%, the comparison group was 44%. So it can this, happen in a training school as well. Was this done by the kind of random assignment procedure that Peter was No, I would about? love to do random assignment. Peter knows that I would love to do random assignment. There have been so many obstacles to that. What are the obstacles? In California, before you can really do random assignment, you've got to get agreement from the judges, from the DAs, from the public defenders, from the uh, youth advocacy groups, ACLU. Uh, there are so many players involved it doesn't take much to ruin a good random uh, assignment right. design. And let me ask Peter this last question. Peter, where else in the country can we look for those promising glimmers of hope that we seem to have in Paint Creek? Anywhere else? Uh, I think many states have a, a variety of these uh, community-based programs. Pennsylvania has a number of strong programs that use an uh, outward bound kind of format, uh, small group homes, uh, small institutional programs, Utah, the state of Massachusetts. Florida starting to develop uh, a number are, of those. Are any of them, none of them, I think, have produced the kind of results yet that you, we can testify to? None, none of them have been held up to this uh, microscope for about okay. uh, four I'm years. I'm afraid we're going to have to cut away. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for watching. For Crime File, I'm James Wilson. Crime File is a production of CF Productions Incorporated, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for this program was provided by the National Institute of Justice, research arm of the U.S. Department of Justice.